Hey, thanks for joining me. It's time to look at another independent comic from an independent creator. Um, I got this book from a guy who had uh, watched some of my channel and hit me up and um, asked me if I wouldn't mind uh, getting a copy of his book. And I'm like, sure, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm always happy and excited to get some new and different books that are different from the mainstream stuff that I'm always kind of putting on the channel. And um, so he sent me this book and... Um, Caesar Feliciano, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, this is the gentleman that contacted me, and um, he's got a kind of a creative team that we can, we'll talk about in just one second. But all of this, the contents are copyright tw uh, 2024. Caesar Feliciano, um, Caesar, I do owe him an apology. He did send me this book forever ago. I'm, I'm like maybe like two months ago, something to that effect. Uh, God, I hope not more than that. But um, I've been meaning to get to it forever, and everything in my life just kept getting in the way. I was in a mad dash to get my own uh, comic done, and before a self-imposed deadline of a local comic convention, and then I had to do the convention, which I did about two weeks ago, and I'd just been tired and burned out, and it's hard enough to kind of keep up with life and work and job and maintaining the YouTube channel and all this stuff, so... Um, it did get pushed back a lot farther than I ever meant it to be. So Caesar, I do apologize for taking so long to get to this. Um, I literally had it sitting out next to my desk every day, sitting in front of me going, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And the, the main thing is, is that I want to make sure I had a chance to sit down and give it a proper read and understand it so I could talk about it. And uh, I'll have uh, links in my description of the video here for anybody, uh, if you wanna contact him and pick up a copy of his book. That's kind of the whole point of this, is um, one, for me, I like to get to see new books, but I wanna be able to you know, show off some new stuff and let people kind of have the opportunity uh, to find a copy of a book that maybe you wouldn't have had the chance to see otherwise. So. Here we go. Gin and Tonic. I remember when I pulled this out of the uh, packaging and I saw the title, I kind of gave myself a little chuckle because it's an obvious kind of play on words. Um, you know, I don't need to explain it. It kind of explains itself. But you see like like the, the Russian hammer sickle and then the, the, um, the oh my God, what is that? The, I can't remember what the hell that's specifically called, that symbol of balance. The, you know, yin and yang or whatever. God, I'm so dumb. I should remember exactly what that's called. But so you can see that it's kind of got the idea of like Asian and Russian spy. I like the cover a lot here too with these two figures standing back to back or not back to back, but you know, backs up against the side facing each other. Um, it's really interesting. I kind of dig that. And I dig the title, Gin and Tonic. I'm like, all right, well, you got me. So... The book, the, the story in the book, it um, it's jumping back and forth between a couple different timelines. Well, just two, like the past and then the present day. So um, before we get too far, Gin and Tonic created by Caesar Feliciano. Uh, plot is by Caesar and a gentleman, uh, Ron Fortier. Fort, Fort, Fortier? Again, guys, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names. Um, and then you got colors by Matt Webb and Caesar. Letters by Mike W. Belcher. So, you know, put together a team of, uh, you know, Caesar come up with the idea, brought on a fella to help write the script, write the story, and colorist letterers. Awesome. I, I, I wish that I could say I had a color book. All the stuff that I've done is just black and white. So um, it's always neat to see your work in color for sure. But the storyline, it starts out 20 years ago, October 30th. So we get this. Uh, you know, it's the Arizona desert, and there's like a, a Native American guy here. There's fire. He's uh, sitting down. Animals are surrounding him, kind of having a little ritual. And um, so his name is Eddie. He comes here to think, to dream, to receive visions. And when they are offered, to, he, he, to receive visions when they are offered to him. And it says on this night, he's going to have a butte. So like he's he's going to have some visions. So that's what he's here for. So it starts out with the Native American guy. Going to have some visions. 20 years in the past. Cut to now, modern day, the Mekong River in Thailand. 
part of the opium production golden triangle. So we see some, you know, it's opium production. So these are criminal. These are bad guys trudging through the uh, jungle there. Um, they get to a place where their boats are supposed to be. The boats are destroyed. And then we run into this guy. He's hanging out in the trees. Young guy, a lot of kind of sass and attitude. He calls them all out. Um, he says, you guys have failed to pay my masters their cut. He says, you know them as the Black Lotus. So all the guys on the ground are like, kill him. So they immediately start trying to take him out. And now comes big action scene with the guy up in the tree. He jumps down, starts just carving up all these guys. He's on top of the horse here. They're they, they, like, I get him. They shoot up. Uh, they get in a crossfire. They start accidentally hitting each other. The guy's jumping around. He's just got these two big badass kind of knives in his hands. In fact, I kind of they kind of look like uh, Rob Liefeld Shatterstar swords, just a little bit shorter. I actually kind of dug that. But this guy is super badass, just taking them all out, stabbing them, kicking them, just mowing through these guys. And um, he's just, he's the super badass of the story. So good action scenes going on through here. They get to the last guy. And like the leader, and he's like, um, "You're gonna, don't kill me, please." He's like, "I'm not gonna kill you. You're gonna do exactly as I say, right?" The guy's like, "Yes, you're gonna sit here. You're gonna wait. A boat's gonna arrive. You're gonna load the supplies onto the boat. Blah blah blah. Remember, you know, remember your place. Welcome back. Welcome to the Black Lotus." So this guy is like an enforcer for some bad guys, and he had to give a lesson here. So this is the modern time. So this is the main character that you can pretty much assume is this guy here. So now we cut back to, again, because the opening um, the opening was 20 years ago, like I said, and then it cut back to modern time. Now we go back to 20 years ago again. Hong Kong, China. <clears throat> little vehicle's traveling around, and there's this couple in there, and the wife, is, uh, she's pregnant, and the baby's on its way. So they're on the way to a hospital. They get there. They're rushing her into a... Um, a hospital room. The doctors won't let the father in there. Um, he's getting comforted by a little old lady. She's like, just sit and say your prayers, trust in your ancestors. It's up to them now. Some time has passed. The father's getting kind of anxious. Eventually, the nurse is like, uh, sir, come with us. We got it. You need to come with us. We're losing the mother. So it was a complicated pregnancy. Something's going wrong. So he has to say his goodbyes to his wife. She, um, she tells him, her husband to give the baby his name and then she dies and then they hand the baby to him and he's just cradling his child tears in his eyes he's got his son but his wife died so a sad beginning to the child um now in arizona because this is still 20 years ago here's the shaman again he's seeing in fire in smoke in flame he says, a child born, the mother gone, pain and loss. And um, he's, the, he's like asking the spirits to go easy on him with these visions. Uh, you know, a vision is sharp, poignant, painful. He remembers an old poem. It says, some say the world will end in fire while others. So, you know, he pauses here. But he basically witnessed through vision the birth of this child here. So something significant. So it says, some will say the world will end in fire while others. Now it goes back to modern day again. We're in Russia, KGB headquarters. <clears throat> and um, there is uh, a meeting of, you got this, this main girl here and then several other um, people that are part of the government, uh, the Russian government here. They're going to have a meeting. They checked out the room to make sure that the room was safe. Uh, you know, it's all like Russian spy, um, secretive stuff. You never know who to trust. Just kind of like your kind of typical kind of, um, you know, Russian spy nonsense that is you don't know who to trust. And um, it's it's always kind of a dangerous situation. So these guys get together. They meet in this room and um, a lot of conversations going on back and forth. But they ask this uh, girl to uh, get himself and the commissioner a drink from the bar. So the girl goes up to the bar, two shots of whatever the drink is, and she senses something is wrong. So then she bumps into this other guy with the long hair, 
um, which I think we've seen in the background here a little bit. And um, she notices something's wrong. She's uh, picked up on something. It's not quite right. So she goes up, offers the drinks to the people who wanted them. And then she goes up to the sergeant and says, hey, listen to me. Do exactly what I say when and how. He's like, well, what's wrong? But then we see them talking quietly in the distance. Then they go their separate ways. The girl just walks up to this guy um, who's serving drinks and she just shoots him in the head. Pow. And then the text boxes kind of show that everything has happened in a matter of like three seconds or so, a couple of seconds. Shoots one guy, takes another shot at another bartender. Um, everything's happening in like bullet time, basically. She tells the sergeant, she's like, he's like, she tells him now. So um, she grabs a chair and then he takes a gun. And then one of these guys that was like a, a bartender, he's got dynam he's got explosive strapped to his guts. So he's screaming. So he's a terrorist. There was conversation of, are we worried about terrorist um, organizations interrupting us here? So he's got a bomb. He's going to blow himself up. So the sergeant shoots a bullet. The girl throws a chair. The idea is happening in slow motion time that the bullet shatters the glass at the window behind the guy. The chair hits the guy, pushing him out the shattered window to have the bomb explode outside. Boom, explosion. You know, the shockwave kind of laid everyone out. Some people are injured, but everyone's uh, still alive, except the terrorist uh, that they took out and the one who blew himself up. So the girl's like, are you all right, sir? She's like, well, thank you. Holy crap, thank you. You saved our lives. You're fast thinking. How could you, how could you tell what was going on? And she... Um, she saw an oil stain on the bartender's thumb. She could smell the residue, the residue of nitrate, cordite, and balsalite, like bomb-making components. So then she intentionally bumped into the other bartender. He, the same smells were on him, so she put two and two together. Like people were packing bombs, she knew who, how to identify them. And uh, she takes off, and then these two older gentlemen, um, you know, that are talking. They're like, dude, where where did you get this girl? She and the guy's like, Captain Tonikova never lies, my friend. She's truly one of a kind. They're like, where on earth did you find her? Find her? The guy says, well, now that's the question. So basically, this whole scene is to set up that she works as like, she's a soldier of some type in Russia, and she's extremely smart, extremely adept, extremely aware, just the same as the uh, opening scene with the guy in Thailand chopping up all these bad guys so now we go back again 20 years ago we're in this arctic wasteland um in russia and um this truck pulls up um it's this place is registered as a glacier research facility but um obviously there's more secretive stuff this truck comes in here and then the uh opening in the floor lowers the vehicle down to this underground lab they get out, and now, again, this is 20 years ago, and then there's this woman and there's this man. They're like, well, that was a heck of a trip. Where are we? And so this guy, this military leader, he comes up. Um, I'm your new commander. Welcome to the ice box. And they're like, at attention. They're like, sir. They're like, He's like, Eddie's, both of you, please follow me. So he starts kind of listing off the accomplishments of both of these people. He's like, the girl, you're a lieutenant Foma Bazanov, um, GRU intelligence expert with a university degree in biochemistry. And she's like, yep, that's me. The guy, he's Lieutenant Kirill Tonikova, decorated Spetsnaz warrior, blah, 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 blah. He's like, okay, you two don't know each other, but, um, you know, take your coats off, get into these outfits here. You may recall that months ago you volunteered to participate in a secret medical project, one dealing with human reproduction. So they're basically, he goes on to explain on this page here that the government guys were collecting um, genetic materials from different men and different women to find the best possible versions of them to combine them to make the most par perfect possible human being. It's kind of like that Schwarzenegger movie, Twins, right? Um, so they fertilize the healthiest egg with the healthiest, healthiest sperm sample to create the most perfect zygote in the world. Once it was achieved, they transferred it into a, the first of many artificial wombs. So you can kind of see where this is going. Basically, they're um, um, they're they're creating a the the most perfect human being. Well, that's going to be the girl. 
that we saw on the previous page. Because this is 20 years ago, we saw the Asian guy who uh, we saw that he was a warrior and we saw that he was birthed by his parents 20 years ago. Now we're in the same past 20 year ago time frame. And these two random people were part of a medical experiment thing. So now they get some papers dropped in front of them. And the military commander says, sign all these papers. Sign here, sign here, sign here. And they're like, okay, they just sign it because they're ordered to. And they're like, okay, you guys are now married. They're like, wait, what? What the fuck? It's like, we wouldn't have Russia's first enhanced daughter born to a, born a bastard. So they're telling him. The special baby, the one that's worked out, is from the genetic materials combined from both of you. And if we're going to raise him for the public, you know, we have to put out the propaganda that um, you need to be married. So they go into this room and then you see in the jar is the baby that was being born and raised. And then, of course, right here, um, basically it's time for the kid to be born. They have to... Uh, dump the fluid out of the container, cut the umbilical, the kid's fine, everything's okay. And uh, the girl, she's like, well, wait, what's going on here? Like, forgive me, but I did not enlist in the GRU to play a wet nurse. And the military commander guy says, stop and think carefully, Lieutenant. Your career, no, your continued existence depends entirely on the next word you speak. I trust I make myself clear. So... You guys don't have a choice, is what he's getting at. And they're like, all right. And she says, uh, yeah, I am honored to be part of this grand and glorious experiment. He's like, great, wonderful. I expected nothing less. Anyway, here's your child. Hold him. And we're going to take some pictures to, you know, send out to show everyone about the most perfect daughter born to Russian couple, happily married. And then it fades back to the guy. The, the shaman in the desert back in Arizona. He says, ah, oh, a second a second one born motherless. What the hell are the spirits doing? Who are these little ones? So much for a quiet night in the desert. So he gets on a phone and the phone says, control. He says, this is night sky. I've just had two visions. Yeah, you heard me right. I said two, assemble the magic men. And that's the end of the book. That's the end of book one of this first story. So an interesting setup of... Two warriors, two badasses, man and woman, one Russian, one um, uh, Chinese. Did I get that right? From when it, uh, God, can't get it. Yeah, from China. We see how they were born, the difficult and unfortunate circumstances they were both born into, and how they both have grown up to be warriors and smart and competent, but... They're eventually going to end up together in some fashion. And uh, that's where it ends. So it's just leaving you some, some kind of intrigue. We get an introduction to all the characters. It's 39 pages of story. So a pretty sizable book. So, you know, some interesting ideas in there. And, um, you know, I'm kind of interested. I, I want to know more. Uh, I, I kind of appreciate the way they were jumping back and forth to see the creation of the characters. And then get to see them in action. You kind of get to see a little bit of everything. We don't get to see them in full, like, who they're going to become. That's This is set up for later things. And um, in the back, there's a gallery. Some black and white images. You know, I would, I would assume this, this is the artist El Guapo. He uh, signs it. But that's our Cesar Feliciano. Um, working out ideas like how to render the characters how to just kind of getting a handle on them i've been doing a lot of that myself recently just drawing images of the characters that i've got for my next project i have in mind or at least one of them and you just end up drawing images of them just to kind of get an idea of what they're doing and what they're going to be like so and i love this type of stuff i love sketchbook stuff and working out ideas it's all neat it's all badass stuff so loving it It's a good face right there. I really like that. And so book two, Hot Blood and Cold Hearts coming soon. And so they basically give a little description in the back here of how Caesar come up with the idea. Kind of a throwaway uh, thing that someone said one about one of his buddies. And, and then the idea just stuck in his name, the gin and tonic. And well, is there a thing there? Is there something to kind of... So he kept coming up with the story trying to come up with an idea to see if there's something there and then he gets with his writer friend and they talk about how they put together the idea and basically create the comic and there it is so gin and tonic um fun 
you know, and I always enjoy getting to see these new kind of stories from things that are not Marvel or DC or Image or anything like that. Just unique stuff that you wouldn't get to see anywhere else. And um, I always like to be able to show these off. But again, Caesar, I apologize once again for taking so long to get to it. Um, if it makes you feel any better, you are not the first person that I've got their book. And it took me a long time to get to it, too. It's, it, it seems to happen more often than not. And I'm not proud of that. But um, I, I did get to it here today. So Gin and Tonic, I'll have uh, links in the description so you can look up his work and his social media. And um, if you like his work, hit him up, you know, support a guy, buy a copy of their book and, um, you know, support the independent guys. Marvel doesn't need our money anymore. So uh, I guess that's all I've got for now. So thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.